So, uh, good afternoon. Uh, and I want to say to thank all the organizers for the invitation to present in this workshop and also to Rob for the fantastic introduction introduction that he has made and he kind of uh, introduced the, the topic I'm going to talk now about no coding RNA annotations. I will just try to go uh, a little bit uh, deep in, into one of these problems that, that he mentioned. So, Oh, sorry. As you might know, small RNA sequencing analysis usually start by performing some basic um, data processing like the identification and removal of free band sequencing adapters, followed by a series of parallel or sequential alignments to either the genome or reference transcriptome libraries. These reference libraries containing a list of sequences belonging to a specific no coding RNA category are then loaded from different uh, databases, as Rob just explained. And in this talk, we will focus on the accuracy and curation of these databases. An analysis pipeline can be related to the process of particle, particle purification by, by sieving. For instance, process sequencing reads can first be aligned to a reference file containing microRNA sequences downloaded from the popular mirrors. Those sequences which align are then regarded as microRNAs. Those sequences which do not, do not align are then passed to an next step which could be an alignment to pyRNA sequences, for instance, uh, downloading from a certain pyRNA database. This is certainly not the only way to analyze your data, but it's quite a popular approach. Let's ask what looks as a very simple question. What is a microRNA? Today, I'm going to focus on microRNAs and pyRNAs just as a, as a case study, but it's, it's just an example this can be generalized. We could say uh, microRNA is a non-coded RNA processed sequentially by drosha in the nucleus and then by dicer in the cytoplasm to yield a 20 to 22 nucleotides long double-stranded RNA, which is loaded into an argonaut protein to silence mRNA translation in a sequence-specific manner. But biology is full of exceptions. For instance, MIR 451, which is a central regulator of erythropoiesis in red blood cells, is not processed by dicer at all, yet it is a bona fide microRNA in any other sense. It's easier to say what it is not a microRNA. It's certainly not an entry in MIRBASE. MIRBASE should contain the sequences of true microRNAs and not the other way around. And we sometimes forget about this. In the case of MIRBASE, it is a community-driven repository of potential microRNA sequences. But it is well known that many sequences contained in mirrors are not microRNAs under any reasonable definition. Even the creators of mirrors admit that a significant fraction of the sequences contained in the database lack proper experimental validation. A friend of mine actually tried for two years to understand the function of microRNA 201, uh, 1201 sorry, in leukemia. This entry was later removed from MIRBASE because it became clear that it is actually a small nuclear RNA, uh, a small nuclear RNA fragment rather than a true microRNA. There are many other examples of problematic microRNA entries. Uh, for instance, MIR 1246 is usually found to be enriched in extracellular vesicles, but it is probably a contaminant from fetal bobbin serum and because it is very abundant in serum, and the sequence itself probably corresponds to a small nuclear, small nuclear RNA, sorry, uh, a fragment of a small nuclear RNA rather than a true microRNA. So what to do? There are methods like uh, MIRDIP, for example, which will not only look at the sequence, but also at the distribution of reads in the putative uh, pre-microRNA ERPIN, and this can be used to discriminate between real microRNAs and false positives even if others have annotated these sequences as microRNAs in MIRBASE. But an easier alternative is to use a curated microRNA database. Um, MIRGENDB, for example, presents itself as a curated microRNA gene database. And I'm glad that one of the creators of this database has just said hi in the chat, so you, you can ask him, uh, ask him from more, more, more questions later. Um, MIRGENDB certainly contains a lower number of microRNA genes if compared with the later, latest version of MIRBASE. However, this gene satisfies some stringent criteria, which are summarized in this box over here. And an important aspect is fibrament homogeneity, um, because 
microRNAs can, can change in their free prime end, but changes in their star position, in the star position can completely disrupt the set of mRNAs that they will interact with and regulate. So let's, let's change now our attention from microRNAs to pyRNAs, which are slightly less known, but really amazing molecules. PyRNAs receive their name for peewee interacting RNAs. This means that a pyRNA is strictly the small RNA cofactor of a peewee protein, which is a special type of argonaut protein. However, the biogenesis and function of pyRNAs is quite different to that of microRNAs. The main function, the main, the main function of pyRNAs is to defend the genome against transposable elements. PyRNA precursors are long pochu transcripts expressed from multiple genomic loci known as pyRNA clusters. PyRNA clusters are regions of the genome where once active transposable elements or TEs were integrated, but this mutated enough to become inactive. Thus, PyRNA clusters can be regarded as genomic graveyards of transposable elements. The biogenesis of PyRNA is probably best described in Drosophila germ cells, but the mechanisms are quite conserved in mammals as well. PyRNA precursors are then transported from the nucleus to the cytoplasm, where they are cleaved at random positions by a nuclei, nuclease known as zucchini. Although zucchini does not show strong sequence constraints, it cuts in the spaces left by different peewee proteins sitting in, in, time, in tandem on the pyRNA precursor. As a consequence, primary pyRNAs show phasing, and we will come back to this in a minute. Once cleaved by zucchini, pyRNAs get further processed. The free prime ends are trimmed and then methylated. And mature pyRNAs found through those of the are uh, reimported into the nucleus where they recognize active transcripts derived from transposable elements. Remember, the sequences of uh, pyRNAs are transposon derived. As a consequence, the entire locus gets transcriptionally repressed by the, by the recruitment of chromatin modifiers. However, pyRNAs can also induce post transcriptional saliency of transposable elements. Bound to a different PUE protein, which in Dosophila is known as overgene. Primary pyRNAs recognize the sequence of transposable element transcripts and the silencing activity, the slicing activity of uh, overgene then cleaves these transcripts. And what comes next is uh, really beautiful, in my opinion. Fragmented TE transcripts are then loaded into a third PUE protein, which in those of is known as AGO3. They are processed to make secondary pyRNAs, which are shown here in red. Uh, and since secondary pyRNAs are complementary to pyRNA precursors, they direct ego 3 mediated zucchini independent endonucleolytic cleavage of these precursors. This gives rise to a second pyRNA biogenic fruit known as the ping pong cycle, which ultimately depletes TEs at the post transcriptional level. Consistent with the roles as guardians of the genome uh, against transposable elements, PWI proteins, pyRNAs, and the rest of the pyRNA pathway machinery tend to be expressed in those cells where the expression of transposable elements is more problematic. This includes somatic cells and germline cells in the gonads and early embryos. If transposable elements are not controlled in these cells, they will multiply and induce uh, mutations which will be transferred to the next generation. Here you can see the expression of overgene, ergo 3 and PWI in different cells of the Sophila's ovaries and the high expression of PWI proteins in human testes. So how do we study pyronase bioinformatically? This is a figure from a recent paper uh, that we published together with Bastian Fromm, the main author of MachineDB, which is a curated microRNA database, and you can talk with him in the chat. He obtained small RNA seq data from the Epidormedal Squamata, a gasotrich, which is a group of microscopic uh, worm like invertebrates which live in water. He asked me to annotate by RNAs in, in this data set, data set, but we only had a non annotated draft of the genome. So, in order to perform the no annotations of the no annotation of pyRNAs, I had to look for small RNAs that form densely populated clusters in the genome, as shown in this figure, and then explore these clusters to analyze whether they were consistent with what we know about the pyRNA pathway. As you can see, we can observe reads in one genomic strand, shown in blue, which show phasing and are consistent with processing by zucchini, since the footprint of peewee clay proteins is usually around 30 nucleotides. These sequences all start with U. Um, and this is a hallmark of uh, pyRNAs because peewee clay proteins have a strong preference for sequences which have U in their pipeline. Net. We then have some antigen sequences uh, shown here in red, which show a 10 nucleotide offset and have A in their 10th position, this being consistent with their biogenesis by the ping pong cycle. 
However, a much easier and straightforward way to annotate PyRNAs is to download PyRNA sequences from PyRNA databases. There are many options available for organisms like human and mouse, but most of them include data from the first paper which cloned PyRNAs from testes in 2006 and later literature. You simply align your small RNA sequencing reads to the sequences included in these databases, and you get a list of PyRNAs. And believe me, no matter where your data is obtained from, you will get PyRNAs. And this is because, as I previously showed show for Mirvase, PyRNA databases contain a small percentage of false positive sequences that can be clearly annotated as fragments of other no coding RNAs. The number is small, it's way below 1% of the sequences included in different data set, that databases. You can clearly see how this small subset of false positive no longer shows the bias toward pi prime uridine or adenine in the tense position. These are clearly not pyronase. If we analyze a sample known to contain a lot of pyronase, like testes, for example, uh, we can see that most of the pyronase belong to the uh, canonical subset, meaning that they show bias toward uridine at pi prime, and they do not show homology to other no-coding RNA families. In contrast, pyronase previously annotated from plasma or other somatic cells or tissues are extremely rich in this small subset of pyronase that we flagged as problematic, suggesting that pyronase abundance in plasma or mammalian non-gonadal non tissues is much lower than suggested. In recent years, description of pyRNA expression beyond the general line or the gonads has become widespread. PyRNAs have been found to be expressed at high levels in cancer cells and in biofluids. But as mentioned, many of these reports are describing fragments of other non-coding RNAs, not necessarily pyRNAs. For example, a recent paper has shown elevated levels of pyRNA 54 to 165 in the sera of colorectal cancer patients compared to normal donors or patients with other types of cancer. The data is very powerful and compelling. Uh, and the authors also show that the circulating levels of this PyRNA could be used to detect tumor relapse after surgery. However, when we analyze the, sequences, the sequence of PyRNA 54 to 165 by BLAST, we realize it corresponds to the first 29 nucleotides of the small nuclear RNA, SNOR57. The stem loop digital PCR method used by the authors to valid validate this PyRNA as a circulating biomarker for colorectal cancer can actually also amplify the full length NOR57, which is more than twice as long. This is due to the fact that CD box small nuclear RNAs contain, contain repetitive, repetitive sequences. And therefore, the primers can anneal, can anneal at different positions, potentially amplifying both the precursor and the fragment with the same efficiency. We looked in the XRNA atlas for small RNA six studies performing plasma serum from colorectal cancer patients but we couldn't find conclusive evidence supporting PyRNA 54 to 165. In contrast, when we analyzed tigger sec data from human plasma, which is a method that retries both small RNAs and larger and highly structured transcripts that are usually lost in conventional small RNA sequencing, we could detect full length SNOR 57 and some three prime fragments derived from this transcript, but we couldn't detect the hypothetical uh, pi RNA, which could be classified as a five prime fragment of SNOR57. As a consequence, we postulate that full length SNOR57 should be regarded as a promising or eventual biomarker for colorectal cancer instead of the mentioned pi RNA. What is this case study uh, showing? And I'm finishing with this the problem of using a non curated pi RNA database. Reads corresponding to fragments of SNOR57 are aligned to these databases and annotated as pyRNAs, even if they are not. This can completely affect the interpretation of the data and undermine our understanding of the underlying biology. And when I was presenting the idea of this talk to uh, Roger Alexander, he mentioned something that I would like to include as the main uh, conclusion of this talk. It is important to realize that our bioinformatics is only as strong as our RNA annotations. I think uh, this sentence summarizes well most of what I've shown. And just like a rule of thumb, always double check the sequences you're going to build a whole project uh, on, on, on top of that. Just check uh, the, the sequence, uh, the, the, the mapping in the genome, and also the mapping of other reads in, 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 in the neighbor region to see if. Uh, there is consistency, consistency with uh, expected or, um, RNA 
processing patterns. So uh, thank you all for your attention and I am um, happy to take your questions during the evening discussion session.